how you see biorobotics in the research field, so in the labs and in the universities, and how it is on the market and in the industry, um, what do you perceive, or if at all, how do you perceive the gap right now between the two, let's say, paradigms? And how do you see this evolving uh, as we move towards 2050? I think they're converging in a way. I don't think there is a big um, kind of a war or a battle between the paradigm of biorobotics and between the classical robotics. Mm -hmm. People more or less accept each other. It would be really intriguing if we had two bodies and we had a real war, but we really didn't have anything like mm -hmm. this. It's, it's rather that we, um, we merge together in a way. So Biorobotics really isn't um, a rigid or it's, it's not an orthodox field. Mm -hmm. So we accept only certain methods that we don't accept others. On the other way around, it's actually we take very much over from a conventional robotics and then we apply some other principles of biomimetics to, mm -hmm. to push it forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in terms of the skills that we're teaching right now and uh, that maybe we need to teach in the future to a greater or lesser extent. How do you think that's going to evolve in the future with respect to biorobotics? Well, it's a very general question because uh, uh, on, on the one hand, we need very good specialists who are very technical. Definitely, biorobotics is a very difficult field when it comes to like theoretical modeling or, or building those machines. So we really need good people who are very well trained in physics and maths in mechanical engineering, in electrical engineering, in computer science, for sure. But on the other hand, we also need to involve people who do the other side of biorobotics, which is biology. We need good biologists, and we need people to translate those skills from one to another. They often use a different language, and they have problems communicating. So rather than having very broad careers of people, I would rather think that but we need a team of people where some people are very good biologists and some people are very good engineers, but they have good, uh, both good, uh, they both have do good social skills and team working skills in order to transfer this knowledge from one domain to another. And the third thing that we often are going to forget is the end user. We can build robots and they are cute and funny and they are all amazing. But the problem is that whether people want to use them or not. So understanding what are the needs of the end user or what makes um, a robot usable, acceptable for an end user is not always comprehensible for a hardcore engineer. So I think also that we need to evolve in a future um, uh, uh, expert in, experts in humanities who to investigate the social impacts of, um, of those robots. And I mean, since we're on the topic, what about girls and how involved they are in this topic and with respect to these skills? Because you talk about, mm -hmm. well, we often talk about how there are not enough girls uh, in STEM. We had an interview the other day with Claudine Herman on women in science. Mm -hmm. um, what's your perspective on this? Um, when it comes to biorobotics, my personal experience tells me that it's easier to get girls into biorobotics uh, to get them into conventional robotics. And this is because of the bio. Either they get interested in the bio bit, or they come from the bio bit, where there are quite many girls. So this is also how you get girls in, uh, into the uh, uh, fields of engineering, like mechanics, mm -hmm. where you virtually almost don't have any girls at all. Yeah, but if you yeah. have this kind of uh, life touch or human touch or bio touch, uh, they're much more um, interested in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the final question is about whether, if we think of our future where uh, we do have robots that have increasingly human and, as we were talking about before, superhuman abilities, so in, uh, enhanced beings, um, what do you think the implications are with respect to technological singularity? Um, I, I don't think anybody knows an answer to that. So this is so unpredictable. And uh, since you're recording right now, I don't want to make any predictions because in 20 years I look really, really stupid. <laughs> but I didn't understand those things. 
uh, but I, I would still like to um, stress the fact that technology is moving really, really fast. But in the past, there have also been occasions where we have been over optimistic mm -hmm. about our ability to understand the nature or our ability to copy the nature or our ability to build machines better than us. The classical example is the classical artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. In 60s and 70s, it's the last century, where people were very optimistic about how the field is going to go. And they predicted like 1980s, uh, we don't need programmers because all programmers have already programmed themselves out of jobs. Mm -hmm. But what happened was completely different. We still do not have those robots who have could uh, fluently interact with the environment and with the user and be com completely autonomous. And, and I'm predicting that I already know there are many cases in our field also where we are going to um, uh, drive into deadlocks. And we have to, we have to backtrack and see where, where we actually and then try different solutions. Uh, 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 uh.